Yes, yes, people. You already know what time it is. You know what it is. It's G and we are back in the building. Big up to everybody for subscribing to the channel. Yes, we have finally hit that 800 subscribers. So I just wanted to say love and appreciation to each and every single one of you. Today, we're here to do another match reaction. We saw Darwin Nunes to the rescue. Yes, I will have to hold that L for the time being um two fantastic goals liverpool obviously down to 10 men against newcastle united yesterday after virgil van dyke contentiously got himself sent off obviously we'll talk about that in today's stream but guys make sure you're smashing the like make sure for anybody who's watching this today whether you're watching this on the replay whether you're live in the chat i will be obviously posting this out um pre-recorded but i will be in the chat obviously you know just chopping up with everybody i prefer to do that sometimes you know <clears throat> for some of these videos where we can just have a conversation you know and just you know just chop it up really and truly and um, but yes make sure you guys obviously smashing that subscribe button if you haven't done so or ready and we're going to start the show soon So, Liverpool, obviously, crazy, crazy, crazy game. I weren't able to obviously watch the game live in itself, but um, I was able to watch uh, the full game after after sitting down last night. And I actually thought it was really, really good to watch it later on in the day. And um, big up everybody, obviously, who's in the chat at this current moment in time. As I mentioned before, guys, please make sure you're smashing that like. But yeah, you know, the game last, um, well, I say last night, but the game yesterday, uh, like I said, I was happy watching that game back without obviously the euphoria and stuff like that, you know, in terms of the the hype trains and the agendas. And I'm looking at you now, but, you know, just in terms of, of course, you know, when you watch a game straight after the game, you know, uh, we'll do our match reactions and we'll do our player ratings, stuff like that. And sometimes you don't really always get the time to really sit down and dissect and stuff like that. And I felt like being able to do that last night and a little bit this morning as well. I felt like I was really able to sit down and, you know, watch the game. Um, in a general sense, obviously, as we know, 2-1 Liverpool, Darwin Nunes coming off the bench, you know, for 10-man Liverpool, Virgil van Dijk getting himself sent off. Um, I'll be so honest, man. I, it, it's weird and we'll obviously get into it. Maybe the reasons why. Maybe you guys in the chat, you know, can tell me. First and foremost, let me know who was your man of the match. Maybe I know the answer already, but yeah, let me know who you guys would have picked. Um, as man of the match, I'll let you know mine in a bit. But <clears throat> it just seems so weird that we played... We In the last two games, we've had players sent off. First, McAllister, and obviously now Virgil van Dijk. Obviously, luckily, the McAllister one, you know, got itself overturned. But when I'm watching it, we seem to play better with 10 men than we do with 11 men. I don't know why. I, I don't know if it's just because we organize ourselves a little bit better we have to be a little bit more conservative you know in these kind of games when we are down to 10 men maybe that could be a, a potential reason because when we are playing with 11 men i almost feel like it is a little bit <laughs> which is funny uh, that darwin Nunes was the one to come on and score but it seems a little bit chaotic so to speak you know in certain phases of play and to be honest really majority i mean in that one game we did play with 11 you know against um Chelsea, the first game of the season, you know, just looked a little bit disjointed and stuff like that. And then, you know, Chelsea kind of ended the game a little bit better, in my personal opinion. But when I'm looking at it, you know, in these last two games, we just look a lot more as we look more like a unit, if I'm being totally honest with you. That's that's kind of how I see it. Whereas with 11, not even so much we don't look like a unit, but it just seems like it's almost like we have too many players at times, you know, in terms of the position of the players, you know, where they need to be, how they need to set up in certain defensive or uh, attacking, you know, transition of play. 
at times it does look a little bit confusing. I don't know what you guys obviously think about that, but that's just how I see it sometimes, you know, as, as well in these last two games anyway, watching the team having to play with 10 men, we just seem to be a bit more organised. We have obviously Sobozalai who would obviously come back in, you know, helps out defensively and I almost feel like it works, you know, for us. So, you know, that's going to be something that, you know, Klopp's going to need to, you know, potentially sort out, you know, because I, I can see Liverpool getting a couple more red cards to, between now and the end of the season. You know, um, that fair play award, I don't see us potentially winning it. You know, I know that's an award that we all love. I know that's an award that, you know, we all cherish, you know, amongst them, amongst the, the tour of trophies that we won during Young Klopp's time here. But, you know, ultimately, you know, I, I just think that we look a little bit better, you know, for it. But obviously to the game, um, how we kind of set up, you know, I think, you know, it was really just a basic 4-3-3. Um, obviously, we knew Ibu Konate was going to be a doubt for the game. So, obviously, he didn't start. So, it was really just a question of whether he was going to put in um, Matip or Gomez. I went for Gomez to start the game. Um, he obviously came on um, later on in the game. But I thought Gomez would start the game just because I thought that I thought before the game that Newcastle were going to potentially play with two strikers. Um, and having, you know, potentially a Callum Wilson and an Isak there, you know, I just felt that maybe someone like a Gomez will be able to deal with that a little bit better. But he went for Matip, fair enough. Um, Matip in the game, he was... Uh, he, he he wasn't shit, but he wasn't that good either. You know, it was like in that kind of middle ground, um, so to speak. Um, but when Gomez came on, he really did play really, really well. And, you know, something that I mentioned on Enza's stream, you know, earlier on today. So if you guys haven't um, watched it on his chill, chill, chill zone, uh, make sure you go check that out on Edsman TV. But it's like when Gomez is in this kind of form, my only issue with him is that can he sustain this? You know, obviously it's difficult if you're not going to then play the next game and then we're asking you to come back in four or five games later to put in that same level of performance. That's not really where I'm looking at it. Times last season where he was playing multiple games in a row, he just weren't really at it, you know, making silly mistakes, you know, not really defending pop properly, you know, positionally, he just weren't really there. And all, you know, all of these kind of, you know, various different things. But yeah, in, in terms of that, that's just kind of how I looked at, it, you know, in terms of, you know, why I would have gone for Joe Gomez anyway, in terms of what we was potentially going to face. But they went with one up front. They played the same team that they played against Manchester City. That might be Newcastle's hindrance, you know, throughout the season if they don't get in any more players because when I looked at their bench, wasn't really that good. I, I like their team. I still think they've got a very good midfield. Um, but yeah, there are obviously certain positions in the squad where I'm like, mm, maybe they need to potentially improve. But to be honest, I don't really care about Newcastle. You, you know, that, that that's their problem and they're going to have to, you know, potentially solve that. But so obviously Liverpool, um, one of the things that, you know, people were speaking about before the game was, what is the midfield going to be, you know? And I know that's probably a dumb question by Tetrich was on the bench, I believe. But it probably is a bit of a dumb one because obviously you're looking at it thinking, I mean, who else do we even have left? But we obviously went for this kind of midfield, which is obviously Endo, McAllister and Sobozolai. In that midfield, obviously Endo being the deeper of the three and then uh, McAllister and, Soboz uh, and Sobozolai, um, you know, just a bit in front of them. But Sobozolai was kind of like, playing a little bit everywhere, so to speak. Again, playing that Henderson role, but obviously playing it a, a bit, well, a lot better, to be honest with you. You know, he's got that energy, he's got that technical ability. Um, and he seems to have, like, I'll probably, I've probably said this before and I'll probably keep saying it, he does seem to have quite a decent, you know, football IQ, if I'm being totally honest with you. Not to say I wasn't really, not to say I didn't know that, but I'm seeing it more and more when it does come to Zabozalai, you know, in terms of positionally, you know, where he's kind of at. And if we take a look here, um, if you guys can obviously see the screen, let's see, I'll just zoom in a little bit more for you. Yeah. So obviously, yeah, you know, this is how we set up. Goalkeeper, same. Right back, left back, same. Van Dyke. obviously we can see he got himself sent off. Matip there, um, the midfield three. And then up front, he went with Salah, Gapo and Diaz. Jota did not make the starting 11. Um, and the Newcastle, it shows up here as 4-3-3, but it was like 4-3-3 at moments and then 4-5-1 at other, you know, during other times, other passages of play. When I look at their team anyway, to be fair, I always think, yeah, I think now they, they do need to be looking at potentially getting a number six in. I think that's where their problems will, will ultimately lie because I don't think any of those guys are natural sixes. Um, you can play a Tonali or Gramerez in a six position, 
but I feel like that needs to be a double pivot. So maybe like a four, two, three, one would work better, you know, for them moving forward. I know that sounds mad because of how well they played last season, but you can always improve. You can always improve. But anyways, forget them. You know, we're, we're looking um, at Liverpool. Yeah, I can see here, obviously, Luis Diaz did get a low rating, but he did obviously have to come off, you know, once Virgil van Dijk came off. Even with that, I did think that you guys already know my feelings on Luis Diaz. I still felt that in this kind of game, when when we're down to 10 men and we need an outlet, I would prefer the outlet to be a Diaz. This is why I say about the rotation. If I had to pick a starting 11, like, OK, this is the team. I, if everyone's fit and these are the guys to play, of course. <clears throat> that I'd rather have Jota and Gakpo in my personal opinion because I feel like it might work better in the forward areas. But when we're in these kind of situations, this is where I feel like a Luis Diaz can obviously come in. This is where I feel you should be playing those kind of players, you know, Luis Diaz, you know, in in that um in, in that kind of left wing position. Heck, you can even leave him uh, alone up front, <clears throat> if I'm being totally honest with you, because then he will always provide that outlet. He's tenacious. Um, he, he can run, you know, all these kind of things and he can hold up play enough for me to be able to say, all right, cool, we can get everyone else to kind of come up. But Klopp chose for him to come off. You know, fair enough. You, you know, people are obviously lauding Klopp for the substitutions yesterday, which they should, because um, two of them worked out in Jota. Well, to be fair, but the majority of them actually worked out and obviously we'll get into we'll get into the other players. But I just felt like the Diaz one was the only one where I looked at and thought, hmm. I don't really know about that one, but ultimately, you know, it is what it is. But when I'm looking, you know, at the team and there's a few players I wanted to just like talk about and stuff like that. First one up was Trent Alexander-Arnold. Yeah, uh, I don't really know when it comes to Trent. Um, this season, he's not he's not been good in these three games that we've played so far. Um, I think he's kind of underperformed, if I'm being 100% honest with you. I've not really been too happy with his level of performances so far, whether that means, whether that is him cutting in, you know, kind of playing that inverted role, or whether that is obviously him staying out wide. He has his good moments, he can pass the ball, all that crap. But in the general sense, I just think that, again, you're showing yourself to be a little bit of a weak point, you know, in the team, if I'm being 100% honest with you. And that, for me, is obviously going to cause, you know, problems moving forward. And I just felt like in, in the game yesterday, obviously it was his mistake that led to the goal. Um, obviously, it's a mistake at the end of the day. It can, it, it can obviously happen, you know, to anybody. But I just felt like overall in the game, I just weren't really too happy. I just felt like he was almost, would I say, getting rattled? Yeah, maybe early on. Obviously, we know about the booking, him and Gordon and stuff like that. Yeah, fair enough. Um, you know, the referee wasn't the best, you know, in yesterday's game. But I just felt like his own performance. I, I just don't know what it is at the moment. But I also think that that's because Klopp doesn't really... Wh whether this is... Obviously, this I'm, I'm hoping this isn't the team that he feels is going to go on and potentially do something and blah, blah, blah. But in a general sense... I feel like he's having issues because what we saw towards the back end of last season with, you know, Trent Alexander-Arnold was that, you know, how, how pivotal he was to Liverpool's forward play. We're not seeing that part of him. I don't feel like he's that pivotal at all. Fair enough. That's not, that, that's not even really my main issue. The issue then comes is that what role is he then going to kind of play within the squad? Because defensively, again, some of the positional awareness that he had in the game, I didn't really like. You know, I felt like he was a little bit, you know, kind of all over the gaff. You know, so to speak, you, uh, I'm seeing, you know, game by game, you know, his passing accuracy isn't really getting that better, that much better. Before, we used to always see his passing accuracy above everything else would always be really, really high. I'm seeing in the 60s, in the low 60s, and you know, in, in these games that we played. Um, not all of them. I think maybe he had one that was maybe potentially in the 70s. But just in a general sense, I, it's quite low for someone like him, who is obviously, you know, a great passer. He um, created one chance, obviously got the error leading to goal. <clears throat> See here, 61 touches. He had two successful dribbles in the game, two out of three uh, successful crosses, accurate long balls, only five out of 14. Um, defensively, won two out of the two tackles, four clearances, headed with four recoveries, uh, ground jewels, four out of seven. So, yes, yeah, stats-wise, it, it was like a decent game, I guess, if you looked at it just from the stats. But when you're watching the game in itself, I was just watching him you know, at moments in that game. And I just felt like positionally, you know, at times, and I personally feel, I mean, you can see here, Gordon, you know, had an 8.2. Obviously, this is by FOTMOB. So, you know, to, to take it how you will, I um, mean, and spoke about, you know, in terms of ratings, don't look at the ratings too much. 
so to speak, look at more stats and then look at the game in itself. You know, I felt like Gordon really did have his number in this game. And then what then what that then allowed was then for him and Joel Linton to be able to kind of play on that side. You know, they were kind of having joy, you know, sometimes doubling up on him. So, you know, that's not going to be his fault. That's going to be the 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 job of then the central mid right central midfielder, whoever that is, whether it's Sabozalai or anybody else, obviously right winger, we know about him. Salah's not going to come back and help. And then obviously the right centre back as well. They weren't always helping him at times, but then he didn't help himself at other times in terms of his positions kind of thing. And again, looking here at Anthony Gordon's game, you know, I felt like he had a really, really good game. Three out of five successful dribbles, one out of two um, crosses, uh, tackles, recoveries, uh, ground jewels. You know, I mean this is a winger, by the way. Um so it's not I'm not really expected too tough too much in terms of the defensive side, but he had a decent game defensively and then accurate passes 24 out of 26. And I just felt like he was just getting a bit too much joy, you know, in my opinion, down that kind of side. And I think especially when you're coming up against someone with the pace of Gordon, you do have to be careful. Sometimes it's not even about being technically sound or anything like that. It is just, well, I've got the pace to kind of burn you. Not always, of listen, sometimes pace will just beat someone who is a good defender regardless because if you're not that fast, then you're not that fast. But I just felt positionally at times the use of the ball that Trent Alexander-Arnold had at times, again, just wasn't really there, if I'm being 100% honest with you. And I think that's something that he's going to need to improve upon, you know, throughout the season. How Jurgen Klopp decides to use him, I don't really know. I, I, you know, it, it's one of them kind of things. I think that's something that, you know, he's going to need to look at because obviously we keep talking, yeah, we need another DM, we needed this, but sometimes just because, yes, I'm not saying we don't need these players. Yes, we do. But at the same time, the players that you do have, the ones that you are going to be using, you know, in the first team and stuff like that, if they're not even doing their jobs really that sufficiently, how can we keep just blaming it? Oh, we haven't got DM, so Trent's role is different or we haven't got DM, so Liverpool are always open. It's not necessarily always because of that. It's because other players in other positions are not doing well. It's because tactically, the way that we set up and things like that. So, yeah, that's just where, 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 how I looked at it and where I'm kind of looking at things and I'm like, mm, Trent, not really looking good if I'm being, um, you know, 100% honest with you. But hopefully, you know, in the future, you know, um, I, like I said, I just hope that kind of, that kind of changes. And obviously we see here with his heat map anyway, you know, down mostly down that right hand side, obviously you had to kind of stick there once we went down to, you know, once we went down to 10 men, you know, it was more of a, a back four, so to speak, with obviously him trying to bomb up, push forward and stuff like that, which at times did look pretty decent as it, as it, as you saw there, obviously created that one chance, but yeah, but it, you know, it might even go back to even the way and take a look at this picture here, just the way that we kind of built, um, build up in games, so, <clears throat> obviously, in this kind of game, the way that we tried to, it's almost like how we set up was like a, um, in possession at times, it was like a 4-2-4 kind of thing. At times, not all the time, but at times. <clears throat> you guys can obviously see the picture here on your screens. You've obviously, you've got your two centre-backs who are split. Allison in the middle, almost acting as that third centre-back. And then, obviously, Robbo and Trent, obviously, there. So, the gaps, so to speak, aren't necessarily too bad, but... What I felt would be, or what I saw anyway, in my opinion, was kind of like the issue with this kind of setup. Uh, Jamie, and big up Jamie, because he mentioned this on um, Enzo's show earlier on. The possession, that, like, it just seems like anything we do just always has to be done just not the way it should be done. Again, if you're going to do this, I, yes, I don't really like it. J Jerry's spoken about splitting the, the two centre-backs, blah, 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 all of that kind of stuff. Fair enough, I get it. But if you're going to do that, then I beg of you, please play the ball a bit quicker than the way that you're playing it right now. Because all it is is like slow possession at the back and it's like you're knocking the ball. And if you look at the gaps anyway between right back to centre back to, to the other centre back to the left back, the gaps are relatively big. We don't really have anybody that close. Obviously, I, I can see here, I think that's McAllister and Endo potentially or Zobosly. But I know I think Endo's in there. Yes, they're dropping deep to potentially offer themselves as an option. But the problem that you have in this kind of game is that the way that Newcastle were pressing, they were pressing really, really well. So when they start pressing, it then causes an issue if you're passing the ball at like one mile, if not less per hour, you know, kind of thing. And then it's like, yes, at times you could potentially, you know, if you do get the ball out to the fullbacks, but look at look at that. Straight in, in that in their kind of four in the midfield, 
you can see straight away, I don't know who that is, might be Almiron or Tonali, you know, st straight on to Robbo, which then causes the problem because then Robbo's only option really in this position is Endo. He's not an option straight away, so you can't play that ball into him. Gakpo, I believe there was a man right next to him. Really, all you can do is go down the line. Now, once you go down the line, you can hope and pray that if that ball, maybe if you can play over the top, if they're pushing up and playing a high line, Fair enough. But if not, you've got who's the left? Diaz. He's taking that ball under severe pressure. And then in the middle of the park, we might not have enough numbers. And what I saw Newcastle doing quite a lot in the game was they were always intercepting passes. Usually I saw McAllister. Yeah, it happened to McAllister a couple of times, but they would intercept the passes and it was the centre backs. They would kind of come out. Once that ball gets played into the middle, they're, they're, they're already there and then they're, they're kind of off. Newcastle weren't creating masses and masses of chances i don't want to make it seem like they were dominating i think in this kind of game what i saw was t both teams were having little bits of dominance little bits here little bits there little bit there i don't think any one team i don't think newcastle were overly dominant in the game and i don't think liverpool were overly dominant in the game we had we each had our moments they weren't obviously creating the chances so you might look at that and say oh but that's fine but the problem that you will have over again it, it doesn't matter now of course because you win the game <clears throat> in the end but you know for long periods of that game it will matter it did matter you know and if new if newcastle score that shot from almir where he cuts in and hits the post or if harvey barnes squares it to callum wilson like you know little things can go in your favor fair enough and we all need luck but over the course of a season that luck will start to fade and once that luck starts to fade you'll start seeing these little things and teams will just start packing you you know then you'll just be conceding goals left right and center something that you know, we saw quite a lot of last season. And that's where my issue comes in. It's almost, I don't mind if you're going to concede chances. I don't mind, like, all the nitty-gritty stuff. I've seen the best teams. Like, even Barcelona, in their pomp, I've seen them concede chances and stuff like that and blah, blah, blah. What these uh, Manchester City do it, Real Madrid do it, you know, Bayern Munich. They, all these teams concede chances. Let's not act like you can't concede chances just because you're a fantastic team. What I'm saying is these teams can see minimal chances and usually it's probably down to like an error from a player as opposed to the way you're kind of set up, so to speak. It's usually, we saw Newcastle's game against Manchester City that mean ends the analysis on. What, how did Newcastle get that chance late on with Harvey Barnes? Rodri error. It wasn't because of how they set up Rodri error. Rodri just doesn't fart us around in the middle of the park. They don't get that chance. It's not because tactically they were, they were set up actually quite fine, you know, pushed up and stuff like that. You know, the full, uh, the full back slash centre backs or the wide centre backs pushed up into the position. They had that one deep. Roger was probably going to knock the ball back to Vardio and then probably just slot right next to him and offer him himself as an option. But he obviously lost the ball. It wasn't because tactically they weren't set up. But with us, I always feel it's because of the way that we're actually set up. That is what's going to be the issue. I don't mind. Yes, individual errors like what happened to Trent yesterday. Yes, they can happen. They're annoying. You don't want those kind of things. You want to try and cut those things out and you don't want a team that's just full of errors. But ultimately, you can cut out the way that we obviously set up in a way so that if the teams are going to get chances, it, it literally has to come down to us and the individual, you know, kind of mistakes. But I just felt like the way that Newcastle were playing, they were getting themselves shots off at goal and stuff like that. I'll take a quick look here. Um, at the stats, yeah, they were getting shots off a goal. Obviously, Amiron obviously hit in the post. You had, um, uh, what's his name? Anthony Gordon. Obviously, he was um, a threat down that left-hand side. I just felt like we just could not really deal with him, you know, down that side for, for whatever reason. Again, I don't know if it's just a case of, yeah, I, honestly, I just don't know if it's just a case of, you know, the, the way that we are setting up. I mean, Newcastle had 23 shots at goal. Obviously, context, we were down to 10 men, I know. So, of course, I'm not even expecting it to be crazily high. But even still, they still had their 23, you know, shots at goal. Um, we both um, each had one big chance um, in the game. They obviously had more passes. Again, context kind of thing. Um, but, yeah, I, I feel like if we look, take a look here at some other other statistics. I mean, I think most of the statistics will be in their favour, which is why I would call this like a smash and grab, you know, because a draw, I felt, would have probably... Would I say draw? I would have said more... I would have le le lent more towards a draw or Newcastle if, I'm be if I was looking at a winner, just because they were, they were getting themselves chances kind of thing in the game. I mean, we had nine shots. We had four on target, which is a decent 
um, a decent rate, if I'm being honest. They had 23 and 8 on target. So, you know, they need to kind of pattern up and they do need better finishers, you know, in those kind of crucial areas. I think that's, again, they've got Isak, they've got Callum Wilson, Almero can pop in with a goal, Gordon can obviously pop in with a goal. But in this kind of game, sometimes you do need that kind of maybe natural type of individual, you know, or more clever players in certain positions, in certain areas, certain phases, you know, of play. And that's just where... I was looking at Newcastle and I was just like, eh, I don't really know. I don't, <clears throat> I don't really know. Uh, the defensive stats from the game, uh, Liverpool made eight interceptions, four blocks, 19 clearances, and our keeper had to make seven saves. You know, we'll, we'll talk about Ali um, in a sec anyway. But yeah, I just felt like it's just stylistically, I'm always going to have a problem. I know at the end of the day, Liverpool are unbeaten in what's in our 14 games. So, of course, people are not going to have an initial problem with that because you're unbeaten in 14 and the team ain't even playing all that great. So everyone kind of just, I would assume, just expect that. Yep, yeah, once we start kicking into gear, blah, blah, blah. But I feel like because we've been going on for so long where it's just not really working, it's just how long can this go on for? It, it, it's, really, it's really my thing, you know, in terms of how we want to set up, how we want to play, how we should do things and stuff like that. And yeah, whether this continues or not, let's hope it does continue. I'd love to go 15 unbeaten by beating or uh, just not losing to Aston Villa. That's going to be an interesting test um, to see how we fare against them. Even though I know it's at home, we should win the game. But again, that's going to be quite interesting. But even just looking back at this game, yeah, Trent, the defence, for me, again, there's for me, there will always be questions asked about that. I'm just not 100% like, I'm just not 100% with it, if I'm being 100% like honest with you. I'm just not really with how we defend, how we play and stuff like that. I just think it looks a bit uncomfortable. Certain players don't really feel that comfortable playing out from the back, but then you want to play out from the back. And then when we do try to play a little bit direct, we don't always have the players on the pitch to then always go direct. You know, you know, it it just seems like we've got such, in my opinion, I feel like the squad is quite, um, you know, unbalanced. I don't feel like it's a balanced squad, you know, for whatever it is he's trying to then do. I always feel like once certain players are on the pitch or whatever, then they almost take up the mantle themselves, <clears throat> so to speak. And then the football usually just goes back to being a direct kind of game because that's what we're so used to. But then I thought or I assumed that Liverpool were then trying to play this kind of parsey parsey football and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So if we are trying to play that kind of football, yes, I do think we have the players to do so, but then you don't need to always go so direct. And if we are going to do the build-up from the back, the build-up needs to be a lot better than this. It can't be passing at two miles an hour. It can't be, you know, if I get this picture up again, it can't be, you know, left in this kind of position where I don't feel like we have even enough bodies even in there to be playing that kind of thing. You probably need an extra player to just come in there, maybe an Endo, maybe a McAllister. Everyone drop a little bit. I know you then want to, it's like you want to go from passy passy to then just go direct. And at times you can do that when the ball's in play, fair enough. But when we're starting out from the goal kick, I just feel like instead of then conceding possession where you get into this position here and then it's like, OK, you know, what do we do from here? Blah, blah, blah. You know, I just think that we can operate a little bit better in these phases of play, which will obviously inevitably allow us to play better football. But again, like I mentioned before, when you're not losing these games, no one's going to have a problem with it. Everyone's going to be like, oh, it's, it doesn't matter, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we move we move from there. Obviously, uh, Virgil van Dijk, another player I want to take a look at. Um, really, I just, you guys in the chat, let me know. Let me know. On, like, honest, like, unbiased opinions. Whether you think it, it was or it wasn't, like, just an unbiased opinion. If that was against your team, if that was against Liverpool, and uh, let's say right-sided centre-back is, I believe it was, let me take a quick look. So the right-sided centre-back was Shah, yeah? If Shah had made that tackle on Gapo or Nunes or whoever, if he had made that tackle, would you guys have thought that it would have been a red card? Honest opinions. Do you guys think that that would have been called as a red card? Would you have been calling for it to be a red card? is the question I want to ask you. If that had happened to us, would you be sitting there saying, no, 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 like, would we be coming up with the whole, yeah, but he did this, he did that, he did this, he did that, he did this, he did that kind of thing? Or would you just look at it on face value, just like the referee did at first, which is to say, yep, it was a red card. Obviously, he's got the ball. He has, he has definitely got the ball, like, in the end, anyway, he's got the ball. But he's gone through the back of him, which is my opinion. 
He's gone through the back of him to get that ball. So he's clipped um, Isaac's right leg and taken the ball. It's almost like he's done it all in one. It's, it's in one like sweep. And you can see it because the way he swept him off the floor, uh, onto the floor, it's all one sweep. So he's taken the ball plus the man, but he's clipped him as he's done it. For me, again, only because he was the last man. If this was anywhere else on the pitch, yellow card and we move. Because he was the last man, for me, that's why I say that that was a red card. I haven't watched. I know Sky sometimes do, like, on a Monday, they'll do their whole, oh, you know, taking a look at it and blah, blah, blah. Dermot Gallagher, I think it is, he might take a look at it. I don't know what they've said and I don't actually even care. I'm just looking at it from my opinion. And I felt the second he did it, as, as soon as he'd done it, and I, I think it was Matip and uh, Van Dyke, they both kind of threw their hands up in the air and they were like, oh, like, you know, kind of get up. I was like, I don't know, you know. And then I, and then I heard the referee whistle because it was so loud in there. I heard the referee's whistle and then he's obviously blown for that card um, or blown for the foul. And I was like, he's going to be in trouble here, you know. He's definitely going to, because for me, he was the last man. So if he's the last man and the referee's given a foul, he's got to give a red card really and truly. Now, for the tackle itself, anywhere else on the pitch, you're giving that a yellow and we move. That's it. Last man, got to give that red card. It wasn't malicious. He didn't stamp on him. He didn't, it wasn't dangerous play or any of the other stuff. It was, for me, it was a foul. It was the fact that I said it was like in stages. It's a yellow card for the initial tackle itself because I think that it's still a yellow card regardless. But then you're the last man. And you're den in my opinion, you're denying a goal-scoring opportunity in this opinion because... Isak takes that touch. He's, he's, he's literally through on goal. Where, where else is he going to go? Like, he ain't going to pull out wide. He's literally bearing down on goal if he's able to get through or uh, get past Virgil van Dijk. So, for me, I said that was a red card. You guys obviously let me know in the chat. Do you think it's a red card? Do you not think it's a red card? I know it was quite contentious and I know a lot of people obviously were talking about it, et cetera, et cetera. But, yeah, that's just my two cents, you know, on the matter. We'll take a love. We'll take a look here. Another player I wanted to look at, and not too, not in too much depth. Um, but obviously was Endo. Um, I see a lot of people talking about him again. This is before I even watched the highlights myself. A lot of people talking about him. Ah, oh, you know, Endo this, Endo that, and you know they weren't. Um, some people obviously were slating him. I was like, right, okay, cool. Like, was he that bad? You know, in the game kind of thing. You know, I, again, having not watched it, I didn't want to, you know, judge him, you know, too harshly or anything like that. But if I'm being honest. I felt like he had a, it was like a, like a, a calm game, so to speak. Like, unfortunately for someone like Endo, Donny's coming to the team. Your first game, you've been put on for your debut to start, uh, to come on when we've got 10 men. So already your bat's up against the wall. In this game, you play 58 minutes and for about, what's that, half an hour or so, you play the game um, with 10 men. You know, whilst you're on the pitch, obviously, for that, for that, um, after Virgil van Dijk got himself sent off. So it's difficult to really judge this guy. You know, passing, absolutely fine. Um, tackles, yeah, one, one out of two. Ground jewels, four out of seven. The only thing I've, I would say about Endo, excuse me, the only thing I would say about Endo, which I wouldn't say problem, but then at the same time, it might be a problem later on. At times, I feel like the game passes him. And I feel like, the, like there were times when I saw whether it be uh, Joel Linton, Tenali, or Gomez, they were just bypassing this guy. Like, he just couldn't keep up with them kind of thing. And that was the only thing. I don't it, really look at those guys as uh, extra quick, where I'm like, oh, you're coming up against Gordon, you're coming up against, you know, Carl Walker, where I expect you to get beaten for pace every single time. I, I, I don't, not to say, again, I'm not even saying these guys are slow or any slouches, but that, that's just where I look at, at times. I just feel when he's on the pitch, it it just bypasses him a little bit. At times, he can get himself in there. You can see he can tackle. He's he is good at somewhat reading the game a little bit. You know, he can find himself in good positions. You know, when it comes to the defending side of things. But in terms of like helping with the build up and stuff like that, yeah, it wasn't really too yeah. Do you know what I mean? But it was just more. I just felt like at times players were just passing this guy by, and it, it wasn't even just him, by the way. I also thought that for McAllister as well, you know, during the game, I felt like at times the midfield um, of Newcastle were generally just passing through this guy, you know, and I didn't really, yeah, I just wasn't really feeling it, you know, with, with McAllister again. I know not to say he was poor or anything like that. I just felt like it, for me, he didn't really have that good of a game in my personal opinion. Yeah, he's got good touches and, he picks out a pass every now and again and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I, I just wasn't really, you know, really, really feeling him in the game. But yeah, with Endo, 
look, guys, let's let's just hold it on the Endo stuff just for the time being. Let's just wait. L let him play. As I said on Endo's stream earlier on, let the guy at least play 11 versus 11 for like a game or two. Then we judge him. Then we can judge him properly. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Like you playing with 10 men all the time it is a little bit deep. It's a little bit unfair on him, especially because new club, new league, new teammates, all of these new tactics, new style. I've got, he's got to learn. I know he can speak English, but you know, even just the language and understanding certain things. There's obviously little bits that he's got to, uh, you know, kind of do. I, I would, I wouldn't mind. It's a bit, it's a bit like the Darwin Nunes thing, which we we'll obviously get into when people used to speak. Ah, oh, but Darwin Nunes obviously had the exact same thing, you know, last season. But at least the, the problem that you had with Darwin Nunes was that fundamentally, just on the pitch, you know, it wasn't like he wasn't getting chances. It, it you know, he was getting these chances and not putting them away. Um, mm. his whole overall footballing ability, so to speak was what were people were questioning, not even the sheer fact of all the other aspects, like, say, an Endo would have to come into. If Liverpool shit and Endo came into the team but were playing 11 versus 11, it's fair ground, blah, 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 then you could, I would say, yeah, you can judge him, just like with Nunes, you know, and we'll get onto him in a sec, just just like with him, you know. But with Nunes, you're playing whatever, and it, it, it just fundamentally just things just didn't really seem, you know, right there. But obviously, we'll talk about that, you know, in... He said, we'll, we'll save Nunes um, to last. We'll save Nunes to last. Um, another player, obviously, to look at, Dominic Zobozolai. Um Yeah, Zobozolai. He's an interesting one. He's a very, very interesting one. Fills in a lot of positions. He can fill in a lot of positions. Um, bit of a busybody. Obviously, he's quite industrial. We can see that, obviously, with him. Um See if I can even move it to the side for you guys. Yeah, there you go. Let's keep the puzzle on the screen. So, yeah, played nine minutes of the game. Passing was really good. Uh, dribbles, three out of four, pretty good. Tackles, two out of three. Ground jewels, that is atrocious. Nine out of 20. Um, recoveries, five. Dribble pass, five times in the game. Context, obviously, down to 10 men and stuff like that. So, you know, I will give him, I will give him that in that sense but was the performance as big as everyone again i feel like we're we're mounting out of a molehill when it comes to sabozalai um yeah i i do think so did i think he played all right yes i felt like he played all right and again we were down to 10 men so you know again it's difficult to really judge but i just think that this whole gerard thing he's not even close he's definitely not even close to that and that's not a slight on him i think we need to be careful, you know, when we're talking about a player of Steven Gerrard's calibre. Like, do you understand who we're talking about? Do you understand the type of individual that we're even speaking about, that we're comparing to Bozalai to him? That's not just, that's not Bozalai's fault. That's the fans' fault, you know, in saying that this isn't a regen of Gerrard. It's, it's not, no, they're not even in the same planet as each other. You know, Gerrard, the consistency levels and stuff like that and the things he could do on the pitch, the way he could galvanise the team. And they're two, in my opinion, they're two different players in that regard. And I'm a lot more confident that Gerard will score, will potentially be a top scorer for a team than I would be as a Bozalai, you know, so to speak. Not because a Bozalai can't score, because as we saw with Leipzig, he can hit the back of the net. It's just more, again, the role that you're playing under Jurgen Klopp here. I just think that that's not your role here. You can score from outside the box. We saw him take that free kick um, in the game, so clearly he can take free kicks um, and stuff like that. But I just think, yeah, uh, like I want to say it's like wide off the mark to say that he's um, he's a Gerard regen. I just think we need to call it, though. Like, I think just give it some time on that one because, what one, you're putting a mad level of pressure on the kid anyway. Not say he can't handle it, but... Once when he starts having bad games, look like every single player will do. When he has a bad run of games, then what? Oh, Gerard! All of a sudden now he's not a Gerard regen anymore. When everyone it keeps calling him that, and I'm like, nah, I don't look at him and think Steven Gerrard. The only the only thing that they've got in common is that they both wore number eight. You know that that's the only thing. It's like when people are trying to say, yeah, Naby could be, and I was like, nah, they're they're not even the same type of player anyway. <laughs> do you get what I'm trying to say? Naby is a way better dribbler than Steven Gerrard. You know, especially um, on the ball, close ball control, technique and all that kind of stuff um, in terms of dribbling. Um, but obviously, Gerard has the energy, he has the heart, he has the work rate. You know, he can spray a pass like there's no man's business kind of thing. I don't look at Zabozalai and necessarily think that. Again, maybe it's just because of the role that he's playing. 
um, in this kind of team. But I just think that for me, he's he's closer to Henderson in terms of the style of player than he would be a Steven Gerrard. And again, I know people are gonna be like, "Oh, how can you say that?" Again, look at the way he's playing. Look at the what. Look at the job role that he's doing. The guy who's filling in in all these various different like defensive positions, obviously down to ten men and stuff like that. So if we use the, let's say we use preseason and we use the first game of the season where Sabozala was kind of playing, he was still kind of playing quite defensively anyway, almost in and around that kind of six role. But, you know, along, alongside that Trent Alexander-Arnold and with um, Mohamed Salah down that right-hand side, what he is good at, though, is because he's so technical anyway, got that shot on him, he can obviously play a pass, you know, every now and again. Because he's kind of got these things in his locker and he's quite in, industrial in the way that he kind of plays, he can do that. I think that when you're looking at him, you're almost like people say, obviously, yes, he can play right wing as well, which he's done, left wing as well. You're almost looking at him and, and trying to compare him with a Gerard who can obviously play. Gerard's played right wing, played left wing. He's played right back, I think, as well. You know, he's played bare positions. Obviously, central midfield being his main one. But I never looked at Gerard and thought to myself, the best thing I'm seeing from you is your defensive attributes, if that makes sense. Not to say that you haven't got them, but that's what I'm seeing with Sabozza, like at this moment. Hence why I'm like, let's just call it with those kind of comparisons. As I mentioned, he is closer to Henderson than he is a Gerard in terms of the style of player that we are seeing under Jurgen Klopp. Anyone mad, mad about that? Blame Jurgen Klopp. Don't blame me. I'm just telling you exactly what we're all seeing. But for some reason, we're, we're skipping over that. Until he becomes that kind of driving force within the midfield, which even his style of play, I don't really even see that. I don't think he would need to necessarily even be that within this kind of team because we're trying to, what I thought was play football, and even if you're then trying to go direct, we still don't even need that anyway, you know, kind of thing, because why would you need a driving force in the midfield? <laughs> you know what I mean? You're going direct, you wouldn't need that. If you're then playing the, the passing football, trying to play out from the back and the build-up play and all of this kind of stuff, then why would you still need it? Do you get what I'm trying to say? Like you wouldn't necessarily need that kind of driving force individual. And obviously, again, with Stephen Gerrard being almost like a focal point in the team, the players passing the ball, always giving him the ball, trying to make things happen, shooting from anywhere, you know, all that kind of stuff. To, to me, they're totally like, not totally different. They've got similarities in certain qualities, but I just think they're different stylistically in what Jurgen Klopp wants him to do and what Gerrard done for so many years, you know, for Liverpool. So, that's where I'm just like, guys, call it a beg, man. It's just, I know a lot of you probably cussing me now, but I don't really care. It's just, I don't want to get, I don't want to go too overboard right now with anybody. Hence why I'm not going to be judging Endo at this current moment in time. Hence why no one can really be judged at this moment in time. Um, kind of thing, you know, we've got to wait maybe 10 games in. That's when I could really take a step back and look and think, okay, all right, well, this player looks good. This player looks bad. He needs to pattern up. This guy looks okay at the moment, blah, blah, blah. You know, and all that kind of stuff. But yeah. That's just my kind of two cents on uh, Zabozala. Obviously, you guys let me know, of course, in the chat. Like I said, let's chop it up and let, let, let's talk. Let's let's see what you guys are saying. I might You might think, oh, I'm completely wide off the mark. But if you think I'm wide off the mark, why do you think I'm wide off the mark? You know, why do you think he's so much like a Stephen Gerrard? And do you think Stephen Gerrard would have, what kind of role would Stephen Gerrard be playing in, in this Liverpool system? That, that, you know, that might be a question to ask, you know, um, later on is if Gerrard was to play in this Liverpool system now, what kind of role would he have? Because he kind of had more of a kind of a free role ish. Yes, at times, maybe under Benitez, he was maybe, you know, a bit more disciplined, in my personal opinion. You know, Benitez really got him to understand tactically. And he really did boost up his football IQ. Julio obviously laid the groundwork and then Benitez took it to uh, he took it to that level of, all right, I'm gonna put you on like Julio built that foundation and made him one of those, yeah, okay, this guy, yo, in a couple of years. Yo, he's going to be absolutely mental. Benitez put him up to that level where you're just like, shit, yeah, this guy's got to be put in amongst, you know, some of the best central midfielders in the world at that moment in time. You know, so, you know, uh, it'll be interesting to see where you guys would think someone like a Stephen Gerald would possibly pay, you know, in this type of system. But, you know, it'll be interesting. It'll be very, very, you know, interesting to see. Um, other player I wanted to look at, a player who is... Cussed out. Obviously, I mentioned spoke about him before. Joe Gomez. Um, I felt that Gomez in the game um played really well. Really, really, really well. Really, really well. Um, obviously, with 10 men, he kind of had to come on and take take charge really at the back there. And I felt like, you know, on the ball, he was good. Um 
yeah, com- uh, I wouldn't say comfortable, obviously, we're down to 10 men and we were under quite a bit of attack. But in terms of just generally, I felt like his performance was actually pretty decent. Um, and obviously, as I mentioned before, it just depends on whether or not, you know, moving forward, are, is he going to get the game time? And if he does get the game time, i.e. if he plays the next game against Aston Villa, are we going to see him the same level of performance? We're going to be up against a different type of threat, the RB one side. Maybe Bailly on the other side, Watkins through the middle, maybe a bit more dynamic and a bit more clinical, so to speak, in those kind of three players. You know, those three players as well can be dangerous, really, really dangerous at times. You know, it might it might be a different game. I don't know. Um, we'll obviously have to wait and see and do our preview on that. But in this game alone, I felt like it was really, really good. Um, you know, even when Kwanzaa came on, you know, I thought Kwanzaa was pretty good as well. I thought it was like decent. Um if we was to sell Nat Phillips, then you'd probably say just keep Kwanzaa here. Um, yeah, just keep him here so that you've at least got that extra individual, you know, kind of um, in the team, so to speak. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that, that that's kind of it when I when I look at um, when I look at Joe Gomez, you know, in the game in itself. I thought, yeah, I just think it was it was solid, man. Came coming on in difficult circumstances, kind of thing. So yeah, Harvey Elliott, another player. He one player I look at and I'm like. He's he's like Jones to me. I liked them before they they were they're now playing under Jurgen Klopp because I liked what they could do, you know, whilst they were still unrefined and stuff like that in terms of tactically and you know getting into first teams and stuff like that. And we've seen Harvey Elliott play his best football at his moment in this career. I would say for Blackburn, I would say that was for Blackburn at this moment in time. I think he's had good moments for Liverpool, but overall in terms of a season. I think he's had he's had his best season currently playing for Blackburn, and that was as a right winger. It's going to be interesting to see where he kind of fits, you know, in the team, in a general sense. Because I don't know where that role is, but when he came on yesterday, yeah, I felt like he brought some real energy to the team. I felt like, you know, he he was kind of like pumping it up, kind of thing, you know, in terms of it, it was just like adding a level of intensity. I think that's the way I looked at. Um, when I looked at, uh, what do you call it, Harvey Elliott, when he came onto the pitch, he was just adding that level. Obviously, we're down to 10 men. You know, at passing was really, really good, you know, in the game. Um, but I just felt it wasn't even necessarily, would I say, so much about his defensive acumen in terms of making the tackles and stuff like that. What I really liked about Harvey Elliott was football IQ in that game understanding when he needs to drop deep into that sixth position, understanding when he needs to kind of move forward a little bit into that kind of pocket of space on that right-hand side, you know, because obviously we're down to that 10 men. At times, you, you almost you need to kind of provide a little bit of an outlet, but be able to kind of play on the inside, understanding, you know, when he needs to press, you know, where he needs to press, how I do press. Do I press them on the outside so that he pushes them out? Do I press them so they can come in? I felt like he was doing that reasonably well, you know, in the game. And yeah, it's just really, as I mentioned, where does he kind of fit in, you know, so to speak, you know, that that's going to be, that's going to be like the main thing, you know, for me. But yeah, in terms of yesterday's game, I felt like he was calm, felt like he was calm. And we go to my man of the match. This is, this is, this is who my man of the match was. And it's this guy right here, this guy right here. And that is Alisson. The, probably the one player that I would be super vexed if you let him go. And there's only maybe a, a couple of keepers, and I do only mean about two keepers that I would look at and be like, "Ah, right, fair enough." Then, if you got in for him, then yeah, cool, cool, cool. You know, what I mean, we can we can kind of do that. But you know, I felt like his performance in the game for me was the reason that allowed Liverpool to be able to go go on and actually win that game. If I'm being totally honest with you, if we look here, is his that this the goal? See if it pops it up now. Yeah, you guys can obviously see that there. Let me just move that a little bit for you. Let's zoom in. Yeah, for me, he was the reason. You know, um, I, I don't even know what else to say. What, like, what else can we even say about this product? Like, <laughs> real talk. Four saves in the box. The, the guy made ten recoveries in the game. Like, yo, he's just he's just becoming unreal. We all saw the save. Um, that he um, made in the game. The accurate, the long ball stuff makes me laugh at times. Obviously, context is always a key thing. That is something at times I am like, eh, I wish you wouldn't do it so damn much because I feel like we don't necessarily need you to keep doing that kind of ball. And sometimes when you do that pass, it can 
obviously lead to a couple of complications in terms of losing the ball and stuff like that, blah, blah, blah. But at times it can be a good relief. But, you know, I, there, there isn't really much else to say. You know, he's the best keeper in the world. The only thing I don't like about the fact that it, it, it's, it's, it's a bit weird. I love the fact that Ali is as good as he is. We shouldn't be seeing this much of Ali, though. Like, I think, I think everyone can agree with that. We shouldn't know that he's this good. Do you, do you get what I'm trying to say? Like, he is this good. Like, obviously, we just have to deal with what we have here, which is we've seen the saves, we've seen how he saved Liverpool and blah, blah, blah. But we shouldn't even be seeing all of this, though. Like, let's all be real. Should we, like, realistically, should we be seeing this much of Alisson? Like, I feel like it's way too much. I'm constantly, constantly constantly seeing this guy save after save after save after save last man this that and the other yes he is the goalkeeper but the the reason why the top goalkeepers were the top goalkeepers wasn't only because of the trophies and the, the things that they want obviously that plays massive part to that and obviously their ability is going to play a massive part to that it was the goalkeepers like the peter checks that's why i rate that's why i have peter check just that little bit higher than an allison because the thing, and, and it's not even Alisson's fault, by the way. This, this ain't even Ali, Ali's fault. It's just, it's really, it's Liverpool's fault, to be honest with you. Certain keepers do nothing for like 89 minutes or whatever. That one minute where you need to make an incredible save because the game is so tight, you're winning 1-0 or you're, it's 0-0 nil, nil, and if they score this, they're going to win. Make that save penalty saves and stuff like that. Alisson obviously can do all of that and he can do all of, you know, all of that as well. I just think that because of the situation, which is Liverpool defensively, in my opinion, are quite shit, like literally just vulnerable. We're just constantly getting opened up like a, you know what, like it's just getting long for us defensively all the time, conceding, 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 conceding. Uh, every day you have to be bloody conceding. Three games in, you've conceded in every single game. Like it, it's starting to get a little bit annoying kind of thing. Like we need to start being a bit more resolute and that's not his fault. That is not his fault. I'm not going to blame him for that. But we're seeing so much of this guy that we're, we're able to even see. And again, work with me, people. We're able to even see the repertoire of what he's actually got. Whereas these other keepers, if they were being tested as much as he's been tested, we, obviously we don't know because we didn't see it, but would we have seen them make these kind of saves? But I like my keeper that I don't even know you're even there. That's not your fault. I just want to make that clear. That is not his fault. That is Liverpool's fault and defensively and tactically, whatever. It's, that's people further up the pitch. But we're seeing so much of this guy. Man seeing him make the save that he made yesterday. Mad save. I'm just like, bruh, <laughs> do you get what I'm trying to say? But then he's constantly saving us in situations. Where would we have even been last season if it wasn't for someone like him? So, yeah. But it, when I say I have check over him, that's me seeing check over such a, like during his, entire period at um chelsea like so integral to that clean sheet um i say clean sheet but that record that they had where they just went for so long unbeaten at home and stuff like that winning as well and he was even integral to them with like it, it was it's a lot with him kind of thing obviously for ali ali would be like at the moment he's maybe top three keeper in the premier league era i don't know we'd have to do a show on that potentially you know, in the future. But yeah, Ali is a, right now, I'm only going to do, let's just talk about him for today. World-class, number one goalkeeper, like 100%. There isn't even, like the Couture is good. I like uh, Manion, um from AC Milan. Um, he's good. He's another good goalkeeper, but Ali just takes it like another level. Like when he needs, when you need a goalkeeper to just save your ass, he is the guy, man. Honestly, he is the guy. Uh, last but not least. Last one of these, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, stem away from this guy for too long. Oh, no, not him. Ah, Darwin Nunes. <laughs> Darwin, 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 Darwin Nunes. Oh, my God. All right. I don't even know how I would even start this. But look, you guys already know. And I know there's probably a lot of you watching this. Anyone in the live chat or anything like that, you're going to be sitting there saying, oh, gee, I told you, bro. I told you. Dude, I can already see. I, I forget in my mind, I, I've already got the people I know who are going to be saying that, you know, to me straight off the road. Oh, that's what I told you, bro. He's got to be starting. Boom, 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 boom. I get it. I hear it. For today, you guys can, you know what I'm saying? You can, you can have that. You can have this one. I, I can't say nothing to that. You know, came on, only played 13 minutes, got himself two goals uh, from two shots. A fantastic goal. 
fantastic, fantastic, fantastic goals. Um, movement for both of the goals, really, really good. It's so mad. Just like a Harlan, man only had nine touches of the ball anyway. Two of those touches, well, two of those touches were goals. And the other few are probably the 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 touch before the goals kind of thing, or the couple of touches he would have taken potentially to set himself up and stuff like that. But yeah, in a general sense, it, I, I felt like when he came on, when he came on, especially him and uh, Diogo Jota obviously coming on before, I felt like they kind of helped, and Harvey Elliott as well. They all kind of helped towards um, you know the victory of the game in terms of their movement, their pressing, their interplay and stuff like that. You know, I felt like all of them were helping out you know, in that kind of regards. But yeah, listen, you bagged two goals coming off the bench. You know, he started all three games from the bench um, coming on, you know, for minutes here, minutes there. I know a lot of you, you're sitting there saying he's got to start next game and I hear it. And you know what? It'll be difficult for Klopp to potentially turn him down to say, yeah, he doesn't start the next game. It would, for me, purely depend on how you're going to play. If you're going to play a way that benefits him, then do it. But that's more direct. Um, yeah, and you might need different pieces in that midfield. Heck, you might even need to start playing more of a Harvey Elliott and all that kind of stuff. But then you're going to sacrifice quite a lot more, in my opinion, defensively than we already are. So it just depends on who you want to play. Gapo obviously played two games at left central midfield um, unfairly. And then obviously earlier about this game that um, against Newcastle, where he did obviously play up front. So, you know, Jot has obviously played up front as well this season. I think he played well against Bournemouth. So, it, you know, it, it's generally just going to depend on your style of play. And I think that's what the question is with Darwin Nunes that everybody has, is that play to his strengths, which I agree, play to his strengths, and you'll get the best from Darwin Nunes. You don't play to his strengths, you get the Darwin Nunes who sits on the bench and ain't playing or coming on here, minutes here, minutes there, and all that kind of stuff. When you play to this guy's strengths, he can run in behind. He's strong enough um, to be able to, you know, battle with centre backs and stuff like that. But that pace that he's got, yo, that pace it can be electrifying. You know, it's, it, I always feel like he's deceptively quick because he don't look like someone who should be that quick. But he's mad fast, mad, 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 mad fast. Um, but yeah, like I said, for yesterday's game, yo, he was on point. Like I said, the goals were bad, bad goals, bad, 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 bad goals, both of them. Can't say nothing against that. Anyone's got sh shit for Darwin Nunes for yesterday? Nah, then that's a mad thing. Because, yeah, like, yeah, he, the, the, those goals are really, really good. I just think that it just depends on your style of play and how you want the team to play. If you feel that the way that we should play is obviously two Darwin Nunes' strengths, then fair enough. What will we then sacrifice going the other way? Hmm, that's where the question then comes into it. Is that going to be overall, is that good enough for the team? That's the question that I always look at. It's not even necessarily him because I've always mentioned his physical attributes are really, really good. He's got those kind of finishes in his locker. It's just the consistency of those kind of finishes is his problem. Can he consistently keep doing that? The, it will obviously, we'll wait and see if he plays the next game against Villa. He does well. Then you keep him in the squad. I've got no beef if he plays in these games, if he's playing well. The problem is with someone like Darwin Nunes is that where people mention, obviously, yeah, playing time and stuff like that and position and this, that and the other, whatever. When we're looking at the way that he's played up front and the way that Gapo's played up front, I'm pretty sure most of you, especially anyone here in the chat, probably told me, yeah, Liverpool played their best football towards the back end of the season, of last season. That didn't include Darwin Nunes and that didn't include playing that way. So then I ask you, why would you then think that he should then immediately start because he you know, had a good game against Newcastle? Ultimately, if it doesn't fit the system that we are trying to actually implement, then, you, you know, it, 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 like I said, it all just depends. People, I'm now seeing revisionism from so many people online and in spaces and stuff like that. Liverpool should go back to 4-3-3. The same people that you people are all watching and listening to who are telling you, nah, man, that 4-3 was dead. Nah, it's, it's, people are, are, are clocking onto it and blah, blah, blah. But then the same people are saying Liverpool should go back to... I ain't here for none of that. I ain't here for none of that. I'm not here for none of that. Ultimately, if you have a style that you want to play, play that style, but then use the players that you've got to play that style. Whoever those players are, use those players. That's all I'm saying. Instead of trying to... It's, the, the squad for me is so unbalanced in terms of on the pitch. He, you've got one set of players, but you're trying to play this type of football. You, you've got ticky-tacky technical players, but you're trying to go direct. You, you, you've got industrial players, but you're trying to play tiki-taka football. Make up your mind, bro. 
that that's my issue with Klopp is like make up your mind you've got the players to do what you need to do you've got Nunes if you want to go play that direct football he links up pretty well with Salah as we saw for the goal for the assist but we saw that throughout preseason and we saw it last season as well the relationship that they've got if you want to play that way then go and play that way if you don't want to play that way then use the players ultimately that means a gap vote that means a jota and then you bring on a Darwin Nunes when we're playing a game like yesterday with where the conditions were perfect for him to actually play in that kind of game. Spaces in behind because Newcastle were trying to push up and get that goal. Then you've obviously got the fact that where they've got that numerical advantage, obviously men mentally, they're obviously also thinking to themselves, cool, we can maybe leave a few gaps, blah, blah, blah. We should have enough players to be able to handle it. Not with Nunes around. With that pace, it will be very, very deadly. And that was obviously there, unfortunately for them. That was their downfall in the game. So with Nunes, you know, it's going to be a love-hate relationship regardless with Nunes. I can already see that. But ultimately, if it means it's for the betterment of Liverpool, I'm absolutely good with that. I'm going to have to hold that L. It is what it is. I'll take that on the chin and we move. Do you get what I'm trying to say? So we'll wait and see, obviously, when it does come to um, Darwin Nunes and stuff like that. But ultimately, in as an overall um, performance-wise, I would have given that game for Liverpool... Uh, 10 men, way at St. James's Park, good in spells. Um, I would have probably given it like a, maybe like a 6.5, I felt like. Yeah, maybe like a 6.5. I don't think any higher than that. I don't think any higher than that. I think 6.5, because I felt like there was, there was a couple of players who just weren't really at it. Obviously, Van Dijk gets himself sent off, so that's poor. Trent, not really that good. Uh, midfield, in my opinion, Barca Bozzolai was, um, uh, was kind of meaty and then the strikers really was just Salah and then Nunes when he came on uh, obviously RBS. yeah 6.5 that, that's just my rating you guys obviously let me know what you obviously think about that um, in a general sense so obviously my man of the match was Alisson um, closely followed by Darwin Nunes closely followed closely followed um, but yeah let me know, obviously, what you guys think in the comment section. Just like to big up everybody again for subscribing to the channel. As I mentioned, we have obviously passed the 800. We're on to 900. Can we get to 1K? Can we get to 1K soon? Can we get to? I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna tell you. I've got my targets. I've got everything written down. Um, as as um, when I would like to obviously hit that mark. Can we hit 1K very, very soon? If you're new to the damn channel and you've not subscribed, please just make sure you subscribe to the channel, man. You don't have to keep me in your notifications if you don't want to, but just subscribe. I would love to have a chat. I would love to disagree with all of you. Big up, Angel. <laughs> I know you're probably disagreeing with something I've said, um, but big up your damn self every single time. Um, big up, Ings, as well. Uh, for helping, obviously, get in the channel uh, um, over the 800. Uh, big up, Psychedelic, as well. Jerry, Roms, Ish. Jamie, uh, Savage, uh, everyone, Quasi. Um, yeah, there's, there's actually so many of you that I haven't even written down, but I will have all of that ready for when we have that 1K party, guys. Um, but yeah, let me know what you guys think. If you're watching this on the replay, make sure you're hitting them comments up. I will always reply to everybody. I'm G, that's today's match reaction, done and dusted. Liverpool, 2-1, seven points, three games. Hey, we might be on the move, you know. We might be on the move.